Senator Ludlam. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. President. Um, I rise to just make some brief remarks tonight, and I'll, I'll commence with uh, the news which is on the wires this afternoon that BHP Billiton has shelved its proposed expansion of uh, what would have been the world's largest uranium mine and the largest excavation on the surface of the earth. And obviously there's a lot of, of uh, chatter and analysis around at the moment about why they have done that. It seems to relate mostly to falling commodity prices and the fact that this gargantuan project was, was always going to be very difficult for the company to get across the line. One of the aspects of it, of course, though, that I think perhaps has escaped analysis thus far is the collapse of the world uranium price since the disaster on the 11th of March in Japan last year at the Fukushima Daiichi plant um, along Japan's Pacific coast. And I can't uh, help but imagine that that must have played some part in the decision by BHP to shelve this project. But I've wanted to know for a very long period of time uh, whether it's the Roxby uh, expansion or the Ranger mine in the Northern Territory, what happens to our uranium when it leaves? Where does it go? It's a question that I, I wish more Australians would ask. It's a question that I wish more politicians would ask because, of course, what we see are the dollar signs and we very rarely take heed of the danger signs. In the interest of finding out where our uranium ends up, I travelled uh, during the winter break um, and spent a few days in Tokyo and three days in uh, Fukushima Prefecture between Fukushima City, which lies about 60 kilometres from the reactor complex, uh, and coastal towns to the north of the plant. And I found where our uranium goes. Some of it in the form of cesium, which is a fission product, so it's effectively a, a broken uranium atom. It's an atom that has been uh, cracked into an uneven and radioactive fragment by neutron bombardment inside a nuclear uh, uh, power plant, quite a lot of the uranium from Australia appeared to be uh, in the soil in a field that I visited on the edge of a dead village, uh, formerly known as Itate. And when I was there, work crews of a couple of dozen or so in plastic masks and, uh, and clean suits we're working earth moving equipment slowly through this field, stripping the top 50 centimetres of soil, bagging it in black plastic and then uh, um, containing it under blue tarpaulins. I've no idea where that material is headed for or even why they were doing it. Some of the uranium from Australia we found even in the form of cesium in Sasaki Keiko's lounge room in Fukushima City where the ambient radiation levels are two or three times what they would be uh, in this chamber or in, in an ordinary environment anywhere in Australia. And this cesium is now part of the subliminal background radiation which these people who were not evacuated will have to live with for as long as they stay in their homes. Some of that uranium from Australia is now buried under a small hill in a park in Minami Soma where um, I was, had the good fortune, this is a city on the coast that wasn't as badly hit uh, by the fallout from the Fukushima plant as, as some places that were evacuated. It was, it was terribly damaged by the tsunami that washed through on the 11th of March, instantly killing uh, 19,000 people. And that uranium now in the form of cesium and other fission products buried under the hill is the result of 16 or 17 months of work in which the city authorities and the local people conducting their own radiation monitoring, have stripped the topsoil from that park. They've sandblasted the bark from the trees and they've buried the contaminated waste under a small hill in their park because they were worried that their kids had now had 16 months without being able to play outside. They're balancing the risks of long-term chronic radiation exposure with the risks of vitamin D deficiency, depression and the lack of outdoor exercise. Some of that uranium from Australia is in the fish, some of it is in the food and fresh produce which can now no longer be put onto the market. Some of it is in the horticultural produce. These industries have been destroyed right across the prefecture. Uh, and what, is, what has done that, I discovered after a lot of uh, time spent with the local people, obviously is the result of the disaster that overtook um, uh, Tohoku on the 11th of March. The wave height at the point where it crossed the coast at the Fukushima Daiichi plant was 14 metres, more than twice the size of the seawall that the Japanese uh, utility TEPCO had built to protect the plant. 
And uh, although two of the operators were killed instantly in the impact, the rest of them then had to contend with a plant that had had all its power knocked out. So although the reactors had closed down, as designed an hour before the disaster, the, de the, the remaining residual decay heat, even of the closed down reactors, was enough to melt the fuel uh, and set off hydrogen explosions in all four plants that then blew the containment buildings apart and left those crews contending with quite literally a worst case scenario in which they would have had to have pulled back and let the disaster run its course. Had they done that, the Prime Minister now to Khan revealed some months later, uh, the Japanese would have had to evacuate the northern half of Honshu Island, including Greater Tokyo, a population of around 30 million people. That's how close they came. The Prime Minister stormed into TEPCO headquarters on the 15th of March, just four days after the disaster, with three of the plants in full meltdown, and demanded that TEPCO keep their staff on site and do everything that they could to keep the, the melted reactor piles covered in seawater, uh, lest that worst case scenario take place. So millions of Japanese, not just those in the impact area, but right across the country are now aware that but for a different fall of the dice, they would have lost their country. The Prime Minister last September told journalists it was a crucial moment when I wasn't sure whether Japan could continue to function as a state. That stuff came from here. It came from Australia. I won't be shedding any tears tonight about BHP's dilemma in terms of their proposed expansion for the world's largest uranium mine. I was also very fortunate to attend the launch of the Japanese Greens, uh, and that uh, is something that um, I think quite closely mirrors the history of the party here in Australia. We are a global party. Uh, we have members in regional and national assemblies around the world, and our uh, footprint in South and East Asia um, is growing all the time. And, and in Japan, we're being seen as the, the answer to a political system that is simply paralysed. The nuclear industry is now openly referred to as the nuclear mafia. It's being treated as a self-interested and extremely dangerous organised crime syndicate with very deep roots right to the base of Japanese society. I attended the largest demonstration of my entire life uh, on the streets of Tokyo in which the people effectively uh, took back the street and are hoping to take back their country. The Japanese are a patient people and the patience has run out. Things have changed. Um, I was really proud to be a part of that launch of the Japanese Greens. It will cost them something in the order of 60,000 Australian, 60 or 70,000 Australian dollars simply to lodge the nomination forms to take part in national elections for every single candidate that they put in the field. But I believe they can do it. And they uh, know what's at stake and how difficult it's going to be to break into the entrenched power structures um, that have prevailed in Japan in the post-war era and now brought their country to the brink of ruin. Um, but for another tectonic act of random and cruel misfortune, they still could lose their country because, of course, in Unit 4, which was the plant that wasn't operating at the time of the tsunami impact, uh, more than 1,500 spent fuel rods are still perched quite precariously in a building that has been severely compromised. So I hope that the Roxby uranium expansion joins Jabaluka, Akarula, Kungara, Angela Pamela and Toro's doomed Waluna project as one of the uranium mines that never was and must never be. Um, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people um, who showed me around, who took me through the contaminated zones uh, down to the coast, uh, and those of the Japanese Greens who now have such a task ahead of them, but nonetheless, I know that they're up to it. Um, my deep thanks from, uh, uh, from here to you in Japan, to Koryama Masaya, to Akira Kawasaki, to Mary Joyce, one of our own from Melbourne, to Sasaki Keiko, in whose lounge room I learnt firsthand exactly what it means to live in an area that wasn't subject to evacuation, to Matsumoto Namiho, to Rikia Adachi, and to Mr and Mrs Murakami, who told us what it was like on the morning of the, or on the afternoon of the tsunami that flattened their entire neighbourhood, killed everyone in the district, um, completely out of the blue. And they told us their story of what it's like um, to live uh, in a temporary accommodation centre uh, not too far from Minami Soma, where they have effectively built a traditional Japanese village, uh, rebuilt a community of reciprocity and care while they wait for their resettlement. Um, I wish BHP well, and what I wish that BHP would do is take a look at the writing on the wall and tune its investments more towards the gigantic abundance of free energy that is falling from the sky every single day. Colleagues, there are better ways of shunting electrons down wires than nuclear fission reactors. 
I thank the Chamber.